as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. I don't think I've ever put my top five NBA players of all time. I think I did, you know, position-wise. And I think, you okay. know, what I posted was I had Jason Kidd at the point guard. I had Mike at the two. I had KD at the three. KG at the four. And I had Akeem Olajuwon at the five. So I did I mean, you can't go wrong with I, I don't think I've – I don't think I've ever – I don't think I've ever, you know – did a top five of all time. All right, so now you got the chance right now, Real Fans, Real Talk, to give you an official top five, top five. Top five, top five? Mm-hmm. MJ, of course. I'm going to go with MJ. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go with MJ. Uh, my top five of all time. I like – I don't know. I, I like <clears> – <throat> I'm definitely a, K a Kevin Durant fan. I think he's, he's, uh, I think he, I think he's the best player in the NBA. If he comes back, he's the best player in the NBA. That's how highly I, I put KD. Um, <laughs> you got him over Kawhi too. Like I said, he's the best player in the NBA right now. <laughs> Do you have him as as the best player in the league? Um, purely because of his offensive prowess. Um, because as Tripp said, I mean, Kawhi is a guy who's known as, as someone who is able to dominate on both sides of the court. Don't sleep on KD's defense. KD, KD plays defense. He might not be the, the, he might, he might not be, he might not be a defensive player of the year ever, but he, he's no, he's no uh, James Harden. Oh no, nah, nah. no, he ain't nah, just, nah, nah. He's, he ain't just, he ain't, <laughs> he ain't, he ain't out there playing Ole defense, you no know, breaking out the, Start the break. He ain't doing yeah. that. You know, um, but he he's one of the most dominant players, um, skilled wise, offensively of all time to me. A seven footer who could dribble and shoot unlimited range. I mean, he's 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 the athletic Dirk Nowinski. When Dirk was in the league, you know, he was he took the the world by storm. Ain't nobody seen you no know, you know what Dirk Nowinski. Well, let's you know going back to Larry Bird, but. You no, know, in our lifetime, we ain't never see anybody like uh, Larry Bird and Dirk Nowitzki until Dirk Nowitzki can. And he's an athletic Dirk Nowitzki. Now you're right. I mean, in comparison to to Bird, I mean, Dirk was was bigger. Um, he he wasn't quite the playmaker that that Larry Bird was, but for a seven footer to be able to do all the things he could do, and especially once he fully developed his post game, he was he yeah. was pretty much unstoppable. I can't give you a top five. I know I have a top one, and that's Mike. Let me say this then. Who who was uh your toughest guard and and who wasn't as tough to guard that you thought would have been a tougher guard? I always say, you know, I've and I've 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 been recorded by saying uh Baron da a healthy Baron Davis was my toughest guard. A healthy B D, you know, Golden State Warriors B D uh was okay. my toughest guard. Um uh, because of you know, his size, you know, he was a, you know, sh you know, big, strong guard who could, you know, handle, shoot the J and get to the basket. And he was super athletic. And uh, to me, he was like one of the guys out there who, who was, f other than Allen Iverson at the time, he was one of the only guards out there who was playing like he was playing street ball. You know, he had the freedom to, you know, to just playmate, you know, anytime he wanted to. You know, guys like him, guys like Gilbert Arenas, when, uh, you know, 
you know, those guards, when they were given the reins to just go out there and play and hoop, you know, outside of structured basketball, were, you know, very hard players to guard. You know, and then, uh, you know, you had, you know, in my, in my time, I had, had, to, I had to guard guys like Jason Kidd, who's, who's just like, his eye, basketball IQ is crazy. Um, Sam Cassell, uh, people, you know, forget about Sam I am, but, you know, he had one of the greatest mid-range jump shots, you know, in the, in the NBA. Very, uh, very savvy player. You know, he, he wasn't flashy, but you look up and he had 25 and 10. He like, and and it, and it all come from in the fourth quarter. Like he, you know, he knew when to he knew when to choose his spots, and that and that you know for me, yeah. you know, I learned from those players like Chauncey Billups. You know, they were hard hard uh, matchups because they were just so intelligent and they made the right play and made the big shots in key moments of the game. And what about somebody that surprised you that you thought was going to be a tougher guard and, and wasn't? In my era, uh, I'm going to yeah. say Chris Paul. What would be the difference in, in him and, say, um, one of those other guys? Well, at the time, uh, Chris Paul was uh, – him and uh, Deron Williams were rookies. Uh, they were young players. Um, they weren't as, uh, you know, uh, basketball savvy and intelligent as those other players. They, were, they weren't seasoned players. They were young. You know, they made a lot of mistakes. Um, so, for me okay. – I mean, they were they were good point guards, but they weren't, you know. To me, they weren't hard hard matchups. Now, you know, I, I take that back. Deron Williams, uh, Utah Deron Deron Williams was a problem. Now, after do, do you feel after what? Do you feel Chris Paul wasn't a uh, as tough a matchup for you because he was such a small guard, or was it just because he was so young in the game that you just felt like, as you mentioned? He wasn't as savvy. He wasn't as crafty as some of these other point guards. No, it's not a. It wasn't a, a matter of height. It was just a matter of his of how he approached the game at the time. You know, um, I, I named all. Well, I named you know BD. I named Gilbert Arenas. I named Sam Cassell. I named uh, uh, I, even Mike Bibby. Um, I, I named uh, Chauncey Billups. Those guys, you know, at a at a at a certain point in in their career. It, the game just slows down and becomes easy, and you learn how to play basketball. And you know, it's not about having, uh, you know, a lot of talent, being fast, being being able to jump high. You know, at that NBA level, it's about, um, you know, leading your team, uh, making the right plays at the right parts of the game, making big shots. And that's what those guys did. When you're young, you you know, you're out there, you just have a lot of energy, and it could be wasted energy it could be you know you're, you're expending energy at the wrong times of the game and at the time you know Chris Paul just wasn't as sad if you watch him now you can see there's a big difference in how he plays the game he plays the game intelligent now like you can see uh the shot selections that he shoots when he attacks when he gets to the basket how he attacks is just you know a, it's a difference even uh even when I was in the league Tony Parker wasn't the Tony Parker that he was later in his career when I was there you know, and I thought he was going to be a harder matchup, but he wasn't that part of a matchup when I had to guard him because he was still an East and West player. When he learned how to go north and south, when he was getting into the paint every time, every play, and attacking a big and getting and shooting his little floater, he was a problem. But when I, when I was in the league, he was still an East and West player. He was an easy guard because he never attacked the basket. What are, oh, what are, some, of the, what are some of the bigger differences – um, obviously, you're not too far removed from when you were in the league, um, and you mentioned James Harden before. Do you, what are some of the bigger differences you see in the game now to when you were in the league? There's no center. There's no big man. Everybody's a everybody's a, a point forward. You know that 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 lane is that lane is wide open. The the, the game is so spread out. It's fast paced, and uh, I'll take it back. Back to 2004, five season, five, six season when I was a Laker. That's when uh, Dean Tony was, uh, you know, the coach for the Phoenix Suns, and he revolutionized the game, changed the game to to what it is now. When he when he decided to go small ball with the Phoenix Suns, when he had Sean Marion and uh, you know um, Amari Stoudemire playing a four and a five, and then when Amari Stoudemire wasn't there, he had Boris Diaw playing a five, and that's when it, you know he he spread the floor and his, his game plan was to get 
a basket up within the first six seconds of each shot clock. He played for more possessions. That's what he wanted. He wanted a fast-paced, up-and-down game so his team could get more possessions. He wanted to, you know, uh, get threes up. If they hit more threes than we hit twos, they win the game. That was his motto. Only thing, it didn't work out too well on the defensive side of the, of the basketball, though. Not at that time, <laughs> but he, de- he definitely changed the game because what you right. see now originated with D'Antoni's uh, his, his system. The quote-unquote stretch four, now that's a, that's a typical position. Everyone needs a power forward or quote-unquote you know, power forward that shoots the, the three and can spread yeah. the floor and, like you said, open up the lane for those guards that can get into the lane. Yep. What are, what are some of your thoughts on, um, obviously, you know, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but what are, what are some of your thoughts on just this whole positionless basketball, as you mentioned, there's no, there's no big man. You got the stretch four. You have some teams who implement two point guards in their system so they got more ball handling. What are your thoughts on positionless basketball? I, I grew up in an era where we played, you know, you know, basketball where, you know, we had a, a point guard, we had a two guard, we had a three guard, or a, a small forward, power forward, et cetera. We got guys who played positions. We had guys who had roles on the, on the court. Now it seems like there's everybody is a jump shooter. Anybody can shoot it from anywhere at any time. There's no structure. There's no uh, discipline. It's just every, every man for themselves. If I, if I bring the ball up, I get to shoot. Or if I bring the ball up here, set, screen screen a roll for me. I'm gonna come off and I'll take the basket. And that's what the basket. That's what the game is today. It's 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 good to it's put it this way. It's good for the fans. I'm gonna put it to you that way. It's good for the fans. But you know, any anybody who likes basketball. Um, I always wanted to ask you, man. What are your? How do you feel? Um, you were perceived in a league. I know you've spoken many a times about your relationship with Kobe. How do you feel that affected your um, career in the league and the way you were perceived by other teams in the league because of, you know, that ongoing little situation? Listen, I'm not, I'm not a person to, uh, you know, put fault on anybody else. Like, I'm a, I'm a man. When, at the end of the day, I'm a man. I take ownership for, my, for my, my actions. And there's a lot of – there was opportunities that – that I let slip through my fingers because I wasn't, you know, smart enough to do certain things. So I, I made the wrong decision. So it, 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 you know, the game, you could say, you know, my, my, my relationship with Kobe affected my, my, uh, my career. At the end of the day, I was the one that was beefing with Kobe. And if I chose not to beef with Kobe, if I made better decisions when I was in the NBA or, or as a Laker, I would, you know, uh, my, my career, you know, might have been different. I might have still been in the NBA. So I'm not going to say, you know, Kobe was the reason why I didn't, you know, my career didn't last in the NBA. You know, I, me, I made, I made wrong decisions. You know, you know I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't pass, just, I don't point the figure at anybody else but myself. No, no, I, I get that. Like you said, it's, you know, you had control of your career, but do you feel that other people allowed that to affect their perception of you as a player and as a man? Of course. I mean, uh, the decisions that I make, you know, affects, you know, it, 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 it casts, it casts um, a cloud over my life or, you know, over who I am. You know, if people really don't know me, all they could do is go on what word of mouth or what they see. And if what they're, what they're seeing and what they're hearing is negative, then they have nothing else to go on but negativity. Right? Right. Yeah, so we're gonna be bouncing around a little bit. One of the uh, the only things that we can actually talk about, especially as far as uh, basketball goes, is the the Last Dance. Um, yeah. Right now, um, I mean, you were a little bit more involved, especially like understanding how the contract situations work. I just want to touch on Scottie Pippen's contract situation and why it's important to have people around you to you know when you're making those decisions when I was watching that I was like there's no way his agent should have allowed him to sign that contract there's no way um but at the end of the day you know he from my knowledge from what I saw you know guys told him not to sign that contract yeah he didn't heed that it's not there's only so much you could do if if everybody in your corner is saying, don't do it, you can't force 
you know, the hand of uh, Scotty Pippen. He made that decision himself. You know, Mike told him not to do it. Uh, the president uh, or the owner of the Bulls told him not to do it. When you have an owner tell you not to sign a contract, yeah, <laughs> why would you sign it? Right. You yeah. know, but you know, I understand. But I understand both sides because, you know, like he said, like Scotty Pippen said, he wanted to take care of his family. You know, he wanted that that security. And trust me, when you come from nothing, and you have the opportunity to make some some bread to you know to to support your family. You know, your family, your family comes first. That's all you're thinking about. Yeah. Family, I could do this for my family. Because I can, I can provide person, this you for my I'll family. You eighteen million dollars for seven years is gonna be like, oh, that's the best thing in the world. But as you know, yeah. but yes, but in, as far as NBA goes. When you're a top five player and you're the 122nd ranked paid player, it's a little bit, you know, different. See, but but he didn't, he didn't, but when he signed that contract, he wasn't the top five player. He became that. You got to remember, Scotty Pippen started bat- playing basketball late in his uh, in his in his life. It's not like he was, you know, um, a good player all his life, and people were like, "Yo, you you guarantee you guaranteed that big contract." Oh, you, you good, you, you this, you that. So he wasn't get, he didn't have that. He was just like, he, he might have been in position where he was like, yo, I made it to the NBA. Oh snap, let me, let me get this bread real quick because I don't know how long my career is gonna be. He didn't have the, the, the Michael Jordan, the LeBron James mentality where he, they were like, yo, I'm gonna be the best player in the NBA. I'm gonna be the best player in the world. Like he didn't have that mentality. He didn't have that, that mentality. He, he, would, he might have just been happy to make the league. No, you're you're one thousand percent correct, and I'm I'm so glad that you mentioned that, um, because that's that's one of the debates we've had on the show and we've touched on where people look at Scottie Pippen and they only look at the finished product of what he became. They don't mm-hmm. realize, as you mentioned, when he signed that contract, he's coming off his rookie deal. Um, he he was not viewed in that same way at that time. They they were just coming off their first championship. He was good viewed as a good player, yeah. but in '91 he had only one All Star appearance up to that point. He mm-hmm. wasn't the finished product. He was still very young in the process. Um, and, and one of the things, as you mentioned, about um, just wanting to take the contract from the research I was able to do after I saw that, because I kind of felt the same way, that it was a little confusing. He would sign that. But one of the things I learned was that he actually was rushing the process to sign his second deal. And in that process of rushing the second deal, he kind of just got caught up in the fact of I'm getting $18 million, $18 million as opposed to what's my actual worth. Um, and that's also pre Dream Team. Dream Team came the following season. So had he yep. waited it out a little bit, obviously his his value is much stronger to get a better deal. Uh, but then, it, but again, no one knew Scotty Pippen was going to be the Scotty Pippen he turned out to be. Not even Scotty Pippen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like again, and that comes from, you know, uh, again I touched on it. Him uh, blossoming late in his uh, in his basketball journey. He didn't. He like I don't know exactly when he started playing basketball, but it was late, wasn't it? Uh, it I was. mean, he he wasn't even he wasn't even on a basketball team his freshman year of college. He got See, that scholarship exactly. during his sophomore year. Exactly. So had he been like you know these other guys like myself playing basketball their, their whole life, where they you know they they're, they're competing against guys their own age, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm better than him. You get to the next level, and oh yeah, oh I'm be- I'm the best at this level. Then you get to college, and you you realize that you're the best at each level that you go in. Then you start to develop a mentality like, yo, I can make the NBA and possibly make a lot of money from it. But right. the, fact mean, he, he, the fact that no, he, no, I'm he sorry. started I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 it's good. The fact that he started out late, he didn't even play basketball on his uh, as a freshman in college. He was just like, Wow, yo, I'm in the NBA. Okay, let me let me get this bread real quick. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. He he said himself, I mean, he didn't even get the reason he got a scholarship, he was the team manager on the college team. And he was only able to get a scholarship because there were other guys who either were flunking out of school or just weren't doing the right thing. And it kind of opened up the possibility for him to be on a team. And I think one of his good friends, I don't know if they were teammates, but one of his good friends had even said he kind of had a growth spurt in college. And he went from mm-hmm. being 6'1 to 6'5 to 6'7 by his junior year. And as you mentioned, he blossomed late. Do you think it's uh, the, or fair or do you agree with Mike saying that it was, it was selfish of Scotty? To, to to sit out and wait to have the, the surgery and take that summer off? Well, and then, think do you think it was fair of, 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 of Jordan 
to uh, to say, call him selfish for that. Again, I understand both the, both sides. You know, um, one, I understand. You know, from Co uh, from uh, from Pippen's side that um, he he wants to, he wanted to get paid for his value. He turned out to be one of the greatest you no know, uh, players in the NBA. You know, alongside Michael Jordan, and he was he was. You know, there were guys on this team who were riding the bench that was getting paid more than him and on the same team. So, you know, that that psychologically played a, a factor on his, on his, on his, in his head. I'm, here I am, the, one of the top players in the NBA, and there's four, five, six other guys on my team right now making more money than me. Yeah. All right, let's rene renegotiate. And, and you, you can clearly see back then the business of basketball wasn't the kind of business of basketball that they're running now. You know, some of the, the decisions that Jerry uh, Kraus made and him, you know, making it known in public that he was going to uh, blow up the team at the end of the season, but you guys didn't even start this season yet. Like nobody was business savvy. Pippen's decision wasn't, you know, based on business. That's not how they handle it back then. It was, it was more of a sport back then. So he handled it like a sport. Listen, I'm this. I'm worth this. Give me my bread. Now, on the flip side, you know, Mike felt like, you no, know, we a team. You're my brother. I need you. What's up? You know, this is your job. This is what you get paid to do. You sign a contract. Now honor it. I mean, let, let's let's win this chip. Let's let, let let's do what what you no know, what you no know, we are paid to do. So I can't say you know one side is right and one side is wrong. They both. They, they're both right, and they're both wrong. How were your um, interactions with Phil? Um, obviously, you, you get him later in, in his coaching career. How, how were your interactions with him, and did you feel he was a player's coach the way he's always been described uh, by most guys? Uh, Phil Jackson. Um, I'm, I want to go on record by saying I love playing for Phil Jackson. Uh, uh, just a, a real quick story. My um, first year trying to make the team in 04 preseason. Uh, we in, were in Hawaii, and Phil Jackson calls me everything but smush. You know, uh, he never called me smush. He called me smash. He called me smuck. He sm called me smooch. He called me whatever, whatever sounded like smush. That's what he called me, but he never called me smush. Um, and, that, and I thought that was pretty funny and pretty cool, but... Um, my 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 interaction with Phil Jackson it wasn't he's a, he's a very to himself kind of guy not very you no know, he's not an extrovert you know he's, he's an introvert so he he wasn't very outspoken um, but he he was a, a motivator and that's what he did he uh, he uh, is a very comfortable coach uh, for players to play for and he motivated guys to play to their best best abilities and I love playing for Phil Jackson. Uh, was it hard for you to learn the triangle offense? You know, I really don't understand how people don't know how to play in a triangle offense. Like, I picked it up just like that. It was one of the easiest offense to pick up. And if you get five guys out there to play it right, everybody on the court can average double figures. It's just, it's just, it's just common sense basketball. You know, you pass it this way, you cut that way. That's when they were trying to do it in, uh, in, in New York, and it just – wasn't working out. What do you think it was that was going wrong? Uh, too many guys that didn't buy into the system. You know, you have to have the right pieces to play in the triangle after guys who aren't about themselves. Like, I tell you, one like the point. I'll just speak from the point guard position. They had you had uh, Calderon here, right? Yeah. He's more of a he's more of a playmaking point guard. He's more of a you know. Uh, dribble, get into the gaps, you know, drive and dish, get to the basket. If you watch him, he's not very uh, – he, he, he's not a, a system player, you know. So he didn't he didn't buy into the, you know, okay, I can play in this offense without dribbling a basketball. Like, you can play in that offense without dribbling a basketball. But, you know, he 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 was who he was. He's a, a, a playmaking uh, point guard that wasn't willing to change. Uh, D. Rose, like another playmaking point guard. You know that offense is takes the ball out of people's hands pretty much. It takes it takes away from people's strengths, and they weren't willing to to uh, give up what what they've the only part of their game that they had.
were there ever um, any strange stories or analogies he used to motivate you guys? Because we heard about him in, in episode three, you know, uh, making a comparison of, of Rodman to someone from a um, Native American tribe. And we've always heard stories of him just kind of being like that coach whisperer who, who can always trigger the right thing to motivate you. Was there ever any intriguing yeah. stories he ever used to, to motivate you? I don't remember, uh, honestly. The only thing I remember um, us doing was before uh, it was you know, in the playoffs when we were going up, going up against the Phoenix Suns and we were going over film, uh, breakdown, the breakdown of their offense and defense. And um, he had us in a little film room and he, you know, he said he wanted us to meditate real quick. So he had us all like sit up, proper posture, you know, put our hands in our lap. You know, he had us breathing deep, had our eyes closed. He was, and he, they started talking in his monotone voice. Think about the air and you're sitting by the water and you can hear the water crashing along the seashore. And I was just like, okay, all right. I mean, but he did that to kind of, <laughs> it's funny, but you know, he did that to kind of, you know, he wanted people to be focused on the game plan. He didn't want, you know, people thinking about families or, you know, what happened, you know, before they got to practice or what they're cooking tonight or their wives or their children. And that's the reason why he did that. So people can actually focus and, you know, uh, keen into the, the defensive schemes that we were about to get, uh, that we wanted to do in this playoff series. Really quick, M just uh, joined us. What's going on, M? Sorry, I had to what's get up, started without up? me. Smush, it's so nice to see you. I know you guys were talking about some NBA talk, of course. Um, did you guys see this Aaron Gordon diss track towards me? <laughs> you just want to jump right in. <laughs> I know. Nice. I, I messed up the whole flow, but it's cool. You know how I do. Um, but yeah, you have to listen to it because it's hilarious. And um, I was reading up um, on it and supposedly uh, he's salty about the dunk contest during NB NBA All-Star Weekend um, that he should have received a higher number. He should have won. And apparently Dwayne uh, didn't give him a good score, which affected him. So he made a little diss track. You got to listen to it, though. It was, it was kind of fire. I, everyone else thinks it's trash. I'm, I'm be honest. I'll take Lonzo over over uh, Aaron Gordon rapping. I'm not. I'm not. I. I mean, it may not be trash. Uh, I just didn't even want to listen to it because I know how bad D Wade's verse on that Rick Ross song was. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I don't even want to engage. I don't even want to see them two guys engage each other on a rap battle. It was better than his verse on the Rick song. <laughs> but did you uh, did you ever try to uh, you know transition? From a uh, basketball yeah. to rapping, yeah, I know my limitations, man. I know my limitations. I'm not a rapper. I'm not a singer. Give me, give me I'm your a, top hooper, three rapper slash basketball player. Uh, you know what's funny? Actually, I'm a Shaq fan. You know, I had I, I was a Shaq fan when oh, he man. when he was a rapper when he had his albums back in the day. Um, of course, you know you can't you know uh, you can't bypass um, Dame to do it out in Portland. Dame. Dame, Dame, Dame Dillard. And uh, I don't know who else raps. I mean, AI dropped the album. Oh, before. Iman Shump. Um, oh, Shump raps. Yeah. I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't hear. I didn't hear those guys, but I did. No, he's fine. Ain't that good anyway, so don't don't worry about it. What? <laughs> Not really no, that good. He's <laughs> no, I'll give it to him. Like his visuals, his. I mean. I guess Lonzo Ball. Has nothing. I'm just not a fan of Hoopers, you know, becoming uh, trying to be rappers. I'm not a fan of it. Why? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just not. I'm just not a fan. I'm not. I no knock to not, no knock, no knock to them. You know, if they if they think they can do it and they they have the skills, by all means. But I'm not a fan of you know people trying to cross because I know I know a lot of rappers who try to b be ball players and they butcher the game. That's the Pete did. Know. He got in the league for for two games. Preseason, preseason, <laughs> preseason, exactly. Preseason. And he probably paid to get in, into that uh, into that spot. He might have. I was about to, I was about to say, Pete. He definitely pulled some strings to get to that spot. He, he was preseason. Um, but now Victor Oladipo actually had dropped like an R and B joint, uh, like two two off seasons ago. He's actually pretty decent. Well, singing is different too, though. If you can, if you can hold the sing, then. Right, but I'm I'm saying even the, the quality of the music is, is actually it does if you didn't know he was a basketball player, you would think like, oh, he's an up and coming artist. He, you know, he's trying to make way in, in the game. His actually drum was actually pretty solid, I think. I think uh, you know, people can be multifaceted and be talented in 
the music realm. It's just awkward for some people when it can come across corny real quick, like real quick. And then for Wade, it kind of felt like he had this iconic career that he just dropped out a song. And it's like, dang, like you've been home for a little bit. Are you bored? That you just hopped on a track? Yeah, so, I, mean, I feel like he should have been dropped a diss track if he was going to drop it right after the dunk contest. He waited a little bit too long. Now we in quarantine, so now you're going to put up a diss track. He figured, yo, it's been, it's been weighing on my mind, you know, that I got only that nine that time, so let me just drop something now. Smush, did you see, did you did you hear the um the battle between Dame and Shaq? Did you hear both of their tracks? For me, I, I was a, a fan of Shaq's so when he was rapping, and I'm a, a, a newfound, uh, I have a newfound respect for D, D. Lillard because he actually can rap. He has some flow. Um, so I thought it was just a, a, a cool little thing that they did. Who do you think won? Uh, I, I can't, like, I, I mean, I like Dame's flow better. Like, I think he can rap better than Shaq. But with Shaq, Shaq just got so much accolades when he started bombing on you. It's just like, he just hitting you with haymaker after haymaker. And then with Dame, he don't have those nowhere near the accolades that Shaq does. So it's kind of yeah. hard to, to compete with that. Dame is actually, he nice. But once Shaq starts talking about championship rings and playoff success, uh, it's a, it's a little tough to match up, especially if you if you if you know if you're beefing back and forth. You can't really get like too crazy as for them to they you know they're not gonna do like a regular battle rap where you just start talking crazy about people. So you can only go by you know what they their, their success they had in their career. So Shaq is gonna have them no matter what. I wanted to ask you, Smush, who who's somebody we mentioned hard and you talked about KD. Who's a guy's game aside from the big names that you watch now that you really admire their game from a distance? Right now. Yes. Uh, I like Steph Curry. Uh, I like a, I'm a Steph Curry fan. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm definitely a Dame Lillard fan. Uh, all the point guards? No. Uh, huh? I said all of the point guards? No, no, not all of them. But I'm just saying, like, you know, when, I'm, when I do watch basketball, I like that dude, uh, the guy from the Dallas Mavericks. Luca. Yeah. Yeah, Luca's nice. You know, I like him. He, he's solid. Actually, you know what? Um, if I didn't know, like, say say LeBron James was a, a player, like, he's, his career started now. Like, I like the style of basketball he's playing now. As opposed to his first couple of years in the league. Because uh, early in the – I'm going to put it to you this. I've been saying it for years about LeBron. LeBron James always played soft to me. He said LeBron James just needs to just depot people and just dunk it on everybody, every single play. Because he's – He's that gifted. But when, when LeBron James goes to the basket, he's trying to avoid contact, and he's trying to do all these small guard moves, it, it, it doesn't work out for him. And I was just like, you know, LeBron James is too big and too strong to be trying to finger roll on, on people. He just needs to go to the basket, strong people, strong people, strong, big body people to the basket, and dunk it on them. And that's what, he, that's what he's been doing consistently for the, you know, the last two, three seasons. He's built like a linebacker trying to, like, do some – Small point guard moves exactly. when he's so, he's so big. And I'm not saying LeBron James wasn't good. I always saw his potential at what he could, what he should have been doing, as opposed to, you know, what he – I mean, he, he was still one of the – if not the best player in the game uh, up until this point. But I, I, was, I, was, I just wanted to see him play strong man ball as, as opposed to being a point guard. We see the NBA now where it's more buddy-buddy and a lot of these guys all work out together in the offseason. Uh, but yeah. guys like Russell Westbrook refuse to be friends with anybody that's not on their team. Do you prefer that mentality of, like, it's us against everybody else or, like, hey, look, let's just all be friends and have a good time when we're on the court? No, no, no. <laughs> it's us against the world. No, I'm, from, I'm, from, I'm from New York, man. We don't, we don't, play, we don't play that buddy-buddy. In my era, it wasn't, it wasn't buddy-buddy. Listen. If I'm on a team with you, we going to work out together. I'm not working out with you know somebody else from somebody else's team. I'm not. I'm not about that life. Now, now, competitively, we've been matching up with each other all summer. Now you know my moves, my strengths, my weaknesses, and now you can you can use that against me when when we're playing against each other in a game. I'm not about that life. That's 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 smart. That's intelligent. What if it's somebody that you were teammates with? And then when they, once they they left on field, still got traded or whatever, and you they still wanted to work out. Would you would that be different? This is not high school basketball. 
This right. is not college basketball. This is not AAU. This is not, uh, you know, weekend warrior basketball. This is your job. This is your profession. You are trying to, one, keep a job. Two, be the best player that you – be the better player than somebody else in the, in the NBA. Like, you're not – this is this is what you get. This is your livelihood. You should take your livelihood, you know, seriously. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be so casual with, you know, your with with this this, this game of basketball that's paying you millions. And I and I respect you know uh, Westbrook's decision not to work out with uh, other teams all stars. That's just that for me. That's just that's just an intelligent move. Yeah, plus, like, the chemistry that happens when you play with your own teammates. Like, you don't want to build that rapport with people that are, you know, your opponents. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it is crazy. A lot of people don't know this, but you get scouting reports every day in the NBA. Like, it's – that's a real thing. So we get scouting reports. Okay, we're going up, the, uh, going up against the Phoenix Suns today. You know, Steve Nash likes to, you know, drive, drive – two dribble drive to the right and pull up with his jump shot here. You know, he's stronger going left. You know, when he goes left, he likes to dribble, 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 dribble. Like, they actually break down each player. That's right. You, you have guys, you got, you have guys on each team, not players. You have guys on the staff of each team that sits down and watch hours and hours and hours of game tape of, you no, know, and their job is just to break down individual, all the individual players, their strengths and their weaknesses of each team. So if now, if, if you're working out with, say another superstar now they can they have that they have that information that they can use against you i'm so happy you say that because again that's one of those things that our era debate so much and i agree i think when you're on a team that's your team and you know that that doesn't mean that you you know got to be disrespectful to your friend that might be on another team but at the end of the day everybody's trying to win so what's mm-hmm. the point of being buddy buddy with a guy who's going to try to take your head off when when all the chips are on the line when you're in the playoffs Buddy, buddy, all that goes out the window. Everybody's trying to win. So why am I going to work out with you knowing that I'm working out for preparation of ultimately winning a championship? Yeah, exactly. So often on your social media, I see you, um, you know, talk about your faith and just how much growth that you've had as a man over the years. How does it feel, you know, obviously the feud that you had with Kobe Bryant years ago, that's long removed, seeing him pass away this year and just kind of, the feedback of the whole nation reacting to him and you knowing your personal relationship, how did that impact you? You know, if you would have asked me before his passing, if his passing would, would have affected me, I would have told you, eh, I don't think so. You know, because of the history of our, you know, relationship, because of things said in, a, in, in the media. But um, I believe that I believe over, you know, I gave, like you brought up, I gave my life to Christ about five years ago. I've been, right. you know, walking with the Lord for five years. And, you know, it's definitely, he's definitely, when I say he, I'm talking about Jesus. He's mm-hmm. definitely gave me a, a new, a, a, a heart transplant. And, right. you know, you can see it in my post that, I, you know, I even reached out to Kobe two years ago. I sent him a, an apology letter, you know, you know, man enough for some of the things and some of the actions that I took, you know, towards him. Uh, I've been, you know, sharing uh, Instagram posts, you know, prior to him passing about, you know, our relationship. I wish, you know, there was an opportunity for us to, you know, kind of hash things out. You know, over the course of the last five years, uh, my heart's been, you know, softened to the idea of, you know, trying to, you know, perhaps one day sit down and talk with Kobe and, you know, hash things out. You know, and of course that hurt, you know, every time I heard him say something negative about me. It would upset me because I'm like, listen, that was over what, 14, 12, 13 years ago? Yeah. We haven't been teammates in over a decade. So why am I still the topic of, you know, and I, I just raised my hands to it and I would, you know, I'd pray about it and I'd, I'd move on. Well, he's been about it and say, you know, he, he loves me. That's why he always. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yo, and, that, and that's how I flipped it. I'm like, yo, you know what? At the end of the day, I think Kobe really, really loves me because he yeah. cannot stop talking about me. Yeah. You no, know, when you when you really don't like somebody, you don't say nothing. You you just you know. But, and only but, people that you care about have the ability to to make you mad and frustrate you because that's an emotion. If you really don't care, yeah. you're a non-factor. But 
you get angry or you get frustrated with people that because there's an emotion attached there. So I completely yeah. get that. Um, oh yeah. So when he passed and I got the news, I was actually in church. It was Sunday morning at like 10:45, 11 a.m. I was actually in church and yo, it brought me to my knees. Like I literally could not stand. Like it, wow. it shook me to the core. And had you asked me, it would ha would it have affected me that way? I would have said hell no. But it did, and it, and it surprised the hell out of me. But it didn't because I, I really understood where my heart's been. My heart was transformed to the whole idea, and um, yeah, it, it was it was it was it was uh, it was earth shattering because I, I never felt that way before about anybody's dying or yeah. anybody's death. Yeah. Did he did he respond to to your letter? No. Hmm. At least you can have peace with knowing that you that wasn't your burden to carry. Like you extended yourself and opened up the doorway to kind of mend that relationship. So it's like, it's almost like not on you. You know what I mean? Because like you made peace with God, you made peace, you know, with yourself and knowing that I extended myself for, you know, this relationship to be mended. So that's all, you know, you could have done. Yeah. Well, I still would have liked for us to, you know, for our paths have crossed and for us to sit down and just talk to see how that conversation would have went, 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 went down. Of course. Uh, Absolutely. In in your personal opinion, do you feel his frustrations um, and the ultimate, obviously, what caused the, the friction in the relationship was due to the just where he was at mentally at that time? Um, because obviously you, you and him were teammates not too long after the Colorado incident and Shaq leaving, you know, L.A. Do you feel some of that friction was just his frustration with everything that was going on with his career at the time? No, I think his frustration and where he was at mentally cause for him to play the way that he was playing, but it didn't it didn't hinder um I don't think it 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 it, it was the cause to why he decided to, you know, continue to bash me in the media. I don't know if you guys know, but I did an interview, um <laughs> a little a little it was a small interview that I did outside of West Fourth Street one day. Uh, I believe it was for Bobby Booby Smooth or Bobby Smooth, whatever his, his name was. Uh, in 2008, it was my it was the summer after my last season in LA, and I you know I did an interview, and in that interview I said, you know the the problems in LA start and end with Kobe, and that's what I said, and that's when that's and that that little interview went viral, and of course you know if it goes viral you know it gets back to Kobe. Now Kobe's ego is you know, damage because here I am saying these things about Kobe. Now he took every chance he could to kind of respond to what it is that I started. So I started out this, this uh, interview by saying, you know, I made wrong decisions. I can't blame anybody else for, you know, some of the things that happened in my career. I can only point the fingers at myself. I can only be responsible for the actions that I took. So again, we wouldn't, me and Kobe's relationship wouldn't be where it ended up and if had I not said those you know those hurtful words in that interview what is you know a message that you would want to say to you know guys in the NBA now that have those beefs or just take things super personal and and when you look at the grand scheme of things that you have the opportunity to play in the NBA and that you know even just the human aspect of it of just like stupid little things that don't even matter you know what I mean like in that moment it feels like the biggest issue in the world, but now you look back years later and you're like, wow, I went to head to head, you know, over that. You know, I know there were situations, but uh, I was uh, watching the other day with Ivan, I um, Alan Iverson, and um, oh my gosh, I'm getting his name. Who's the correspondent for ESPN, guys? Stephen A. Stephen A. So sorry, I forgot that. And he was speaking about how they didn't talk for years and it was something so like stupid. And then they hashed it out and they finally spoke. So, what is something that you would want to say to, you know, younger guys in the NBA? One thing I would say is what happens in the locker room stays in the locker room. Hmm. And you hear that, you know, you, you hear people say that all the time. Um, God, even God, that's, a, that's even a rule on the team that you're on. But, you know, a lot of people don't keep what goes on in-house, in-house. You know, uh, we all understand that the media is not our friend. We yeah. all know that as athletes. But people still go to the media and say certain things. And once that information is out, there's no bringing it back. Mm -hmm. So if you have a if you have an issue with your brother, because at the end of the day we're all brothers, you know. If you if you if 
if you're on a team, you know, on a Detroit Pistons team, all 15 of those guys are your brothers. Like, you guys right. know, you know, bleed the same, you know, blood. You guys are out there with the same objective. You guys don't want to, you know, go to, you know, the, the next the next door neighbor's house and let, let people know what's going on inside your house. You wouldn't right. do that in your personal life. Especially now where social media is much different from, you yeah. know, obviously when much you different. put it's a whole different world now. People are going viral for things and you have Twitter, yeah. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. There's so many apps, so little. So dis- different. It's, 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 uh, it's dangerous. Yeah. It's dangerous because yeah. cause people nowadays, they don't have no self-control. They get mm-hmm. they get a little beef, they get a little issue, and and it's up on Twitter, it's yeah. up on uh, it's up on Facebook, and now once that information is out, now people are running with it. Now mm-hmm. people are you know making all kinds of stories that they are, that are allegations about a little snippet of what you wrote in a in a, a twenty a thirty six character uh, message. We just saw recently three of the top players uh, in the country have decided to go to G League. I think it's up to like. 500,000 a year, something like that for the salary. How much more of this do you think is going to take before colleges decide, all right, maybe we should either pay the players or let them make money off their likeness or something that can generate revenue for them? If they don't make a decision within the next one or two years, then they're going to be missing out on a, on a they're, they're going to be so far behind. They're going to be behind. Because a lot of uh, players are, you know, college players or just players in general are upset that they're, you know, they're not getting paid to go to school. That, you know, these colleges are making so much money off of them and they're not even, they're they're struggling to eat at night. You know, you have players that eat ramen noodle at night. Like, how do you perform on ramen noodles? Like, how do you perform at a high, at a high basketball level as an athlete? And you're yeah. eating PB and J for lunch. Yeah. Like that's yeah, not. I, I ran track for Towson, and I remember a lot of the football players I went to school with. Um, not only were they after the the dining hall closed, they didn't have any food or money. The rebate check that they got, you had some guys that were sitting at home, you know, because of the situation that they came from, mm-hmm. or trying to make it stretch an entire semester when it just wasn't enough. And it's like insane because our football team the year i i got there we won like the caa championship and they were brought they so much money into the school and that college football coach was like one of the highest paid in maryland went to townsend and i just remember being like i know these guys in the team who were literally struggling and then you can't work because mm-hmm. how you're a division one athlete trying to hold down a job so yeah um i think that it, it's just insane and you know i'm happy for the the athletes that ended up going to the G League, you know, fresh out because there's money to be made and they're talented and it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you see how quick the NBA reacted to uh, um, what's Alonzo Ball's father's name? Oh, uh, LeVar. LeVar Ball. LeVar Ball. You see how, how quick the NBA made adjustments to making, you know, you know that uh, available for players to go out of, college, out of high school to, to be paid athletes after, you know, one year of, you know, LeVar Ball's league. Like, they, they did that to combat his mm-hmm. league. Yeah. yeah. So, they so if, the, if the NCAA doesn't, you know, smarten up, they're going to lose out on players. They're going to lose out on, you know, being the re- recruiting class and uh, being able to generate revenue through, through basketball or athletes right. in general. You're completely correct. They're going to miss out on a lot of the top guys. Um, because as Jalen Green, who's the number one prospect, he has that option. Um, he goes straight to the G League, you know, program that's going to allow him to fast track his way into the NBA. The only thing with it is everyone's not going to be eligible for it. Like it, from what I've read, there's a, there's a process. You, you've had to be part of USA Basketball throughout your teens. You had to be somebody who was ranked for several years to kind of get that opportunity. Do you think players who may not have the opportunity to go to the G League route are going to continue to go overseas or go to Australia as you mentioned, the Ball family, because LaMelo went over there, did really well, and he improved his draft stock actually playing in Australia. The guys who don't get picked to uh, play in this G League or guys who are to play in the G League that didn't make it? No, no. The, the guy, so the, the, with the G League program, um, mm-hmm. from, I mean, and it, obviously it could change as, as years go on, but right now they're kind of focusing on top 20 talent, meaning 
Okay. If you were a guy who was already playing through USA basketball and you played on the under you know, the under eighteen teams or the under sixteen teams yeah. and you were ranked for a couple years throughout high school, those are the guys they're kind of given the opportunity to because those are quote unquote campus prospects. Right. A guy who a guy who may have been going to a mid major school won't get the opportunity to go through the G League route just yet. That's probably a couple years okay. down the line. So right. for guys for guys who let's say are ranked within the top or let's say anywhere from – if you're a high school player and you're ranked anywhere from 30 to 50 and the G League isn't an option for you, do you think those guys are going to decide to go play D1 at a school that has a scholarship available to them or will they try to take the LaMelo route and say, I'll go to Australia and make hundred grand this year or, or go play in, in Europe? Well, I think if guys I – think, I think, honestly, this is going to be good for those, those uh, mid-level guys who aren't the top – you know, cream of the crop to actually go to a high D1 uh, division school because now you have the cream of the crop, you know, high school players opting out of going to college. These other these D1 schools still need players. No, so now they're going to go down the line. Okay, the top. Okay, we're not going to get the number one. We're not going to get to – okay, the top 20 guys are going to play to get money. Now the guys from 21 down who weren't being highly recruited – are now going to be highly recruited to go to D1. So it, it, it's going to be twofold. It's, it's, it's going to help these mid-level players who weren't the top guys in the country get to play at a North Carolina or Duke or a UConn or, you know, a Kansas. Or, so they may not go overseas. And they I don't think they're going to go overseas. I think that they'll go to college route, actually. The rest of I think they'll go to college route. guys. Yeah, the mid tier guys. I think they'll go to college route because yeah. at the end of the day, that one that they're going to uh, appreciate getting that education, and two, they I'm sure they're going to want to stay local. Especially if a guy who maybe would have gone to a lower end D one school gets an opportunity to go to a Duke or or or, or uh, one of the bigger name colleges, it'll give them a lot more exposure than they would have gotten going to like Eastern Kentucky. Or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Too much because you 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 were able to play overseas. If you're a guy, if your sole purpose is look, I'm trying to get into the league. Do you say, look, I'm gonna go play and I'll get paid for that year or two to play overseas to to transition myself into the NBA lifestyle, or would you still encourage a guy to go the D1 route and go to a college and possibly play there a year or two? Me, I would say stay here. Go to school here, because you 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 you're visible here. Yeah, you're visible here. Like you you go you go overseas, you get you get lost in the sauce. You be forgotten about. You know, uh, you go overseas and you know um, you can have a hell of a season overseas. But somebody who decided to go to school here, you know, who worked you know their butt off all all you know their college career and they're getting numbers, you know. People, NBA, NBA scouts go to these games. So they see these games. They see these guys playing in college. So it, I, I think, you know, if you, if you tell somebody to go overseas, I wouldn't do it because, you, you again, no one's seeing you play. The exposure is a little bit more limited over, over there than if you were playing college because at least you'll have a chance to get into the tournament, which will mm -hmm. give you a lot more exposure, especially if you become a Cinderella team even. It'll just give you a lot more exposure for, the, for those. Yeah. Yeah. Now I wanna um. So we had we actually we had uh, Al Harrington on a couple of uh, well maybe a couple of months ago now, but you know he's he's like really for the whole marijuana movement in sports. Um, what's what's your take on the league and them opening up their stance on on medical marijuana uh, for for players? Keep in mind, we understand that you're working towards a career as an official. So, Trip, we, we don't want him saying anything that could affect, you know what I'm saying, that, that progression he's making Listen, right No, now. no, no, no. I'm, 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 I don't smoke weed. I tried it, you know, a handful of times, but I'm not a smoker and never been a smoker. Um, am I an advocate of it? I mean, smoking weed does have its benefits. Because I do want to be clear, too, it's not um... – only smoke it, cause I, cause I know that's the idea everybody gets when they uh -huh. think about weed. But you know, you know the creams and the oils. The THC, uh, yeah, the THC, yeah. yeah. 
I'm I'm an advocate of that. I had good a good uh, you know good reviews with the uh, C, uh, CBD. Excuse me, the yeah. CBD oils and the CBD creams. You know, I am an advocate of that. I actually um, have had you know uh, massages with CBD cream, and it seems to work. So yeah, um, I'm I'm open to that. But you, that's not what your question was. Your question was the whole. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thank the you, because I about, was about to say, clarify your question. Excuse me. Your yeah, question was, it was clearly about, it was clearly about smoking it. Yeah, excuse right. me. I know, I know, right. I know, I, listen, I know, I know, I'm a name, I'm not going to name this player, but I'm going to say I play with a, a guy who, who can smoke weed until 5 a.m., not sleep, and then come to practice or come to a game and, and drop 40. You know, some guys are built like that, and then other guys aren't. Um, if I had a choice, to, if I had a choice whether I want an NBA with weed legal and an NBA with weed illegal, I would say I want an NBA with weed weed illegal. We don't want to throw no names out, but that player you referenced, would that player happen to be from Queens? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, see, right. no, 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 no. All right, no, I'll just, nah, again, nah, we're not throwing nah. no names. Time out, time out. Everything that went down with LO wasn't the LO that I know. Okay. That's a, that was a different LO. And the, the reason why, so I don't even want to go on record by saying this, but that, that, that LO that happened, it, that was a tragedy because I know LO personally before, you know, the reality show. I'm going to just leave it like that. Before the reality show. And that's a good dude. Matter of fact, one of the best dudes I've ever met in my life. Mm. Lamar Odom was a, a good dude and it, it's sad to you know see and hear what happened to him Yeah, I took that to heart because I know LO I know him better than that I know his friends and I know his family and they would have never let that go down had they been there with him had they yes. been there All right. let me go on record had they been there he, he that's what I'm going to say Uh-huh. This is real fans, real talk. talk. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. Reporting live from the cam. High in demand. So please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot. So put a tie on your plans. On court. Talk of sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Flores, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so we no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real Yo. fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. 